Um, yeah, thank you. So I'm going to talk about um, maybe a more limited technique. It's going to measure two things. And it's going to measure them really well. As opposed to some of these other techniques, which measure a lot of things about a, a lot of things. I'll start off by asking what's the motivation for having an analytical technique that's so limited? Um, in concrete, there's a going to introduce a lot of the, the reasons why we want, want to know carbon. But since we can also measure sulfur, that's included in the, the presentation also. But I'd point to, uh, first of all, this is the GCCA roadmap. And you can see sustainability net zero concrete roadmaps from a number of different jurisdictions. And they're kind of coalescing around the same recommended actions. And if you examine the roadmaps, you can often find there's two things included in those roadmaps. They're, they're going to take credit in their roadmap for natural carbonation of uh, cementitious materials and service. And then they have a, the biggest part of many roadmaps is this, in this case, the purple one, which is uh, carbon capture storage and utilization. So while utilization will not represent the majority of the purple 36% reduction, it is part of the strategies that have been identified. Specifically, what does utilization mean within concrete and how does the CO2 end up coming into the, into the concrete? It's where you're using the CO2 as a feedstock in the production of something, in this case, um, concrete, but it could be a chemical or something else like that. We're advantageous in the concrete uh, sphere because when you use CO2, it's mineralized, and that's actually converting the CO2 to a lower energy state, which means as opposed to converting it into a fuel, you don't have to add energy to break the carbon bonds that perform something else. So if you just track on the, uh, the right hand side, if you start with CO2 and you make a mineral, you're uh, giving up some energy, the temperature is released, whereas if you're adding energy to turn it into a chemical, you're adding energy to turn that chemical into the fuel, you're releasing energy and you end up with CO2. So in the built environment, we're looking at this lower energy state per Along this idea, if you're going to intentionally use CO2 in the cemented concrete value chain, you can see the interest is growing, just tracking the uh, publication interest of the topic over the years. You can see over the last 15 years, it's kind of um, taken off a little bit. And you'll see elements of uh, utilization strategies showing up in, in these various roadmaps, as I mentioned earlier. So how are you using CO2 purposefully in cemented concrete production? There's actually ways to do it in all the different elements of a concrete mix. And I'll just be referring to, I think these are the mixed proportions from the National Ready Mix Concrete Association's generic ready mix uh, concrete. And so most of it is aggregates, and you can turn towards solutions that are dealing with recycled concrete as aggregates, the solutions that look at making aggregates from alkaline wastes and CO2 to make basically man-made limestone aggregates. Um, you can have SCMs based upon carbonated materials. You can have um, binders as replacing Portland cement that are activated by CO2. Uh, some of the work that my, myself and my company is involved in is using CO2 as an admixture or CO2 as part of the uh, water that's put into the concrete. And so these ideas are actually reaching the marketplace. These are all photographs from industrialized examples of these technologies. There's a block plant there making blocks that are going to go into a chamber and they'll be cured in a, in a, a chamber instead of a steam chamber or a CO2 pressure chamber. Uh, an example from Switzerland where they're taking recycled concrete aggregate, putting it into these orange containers, filling them up with CO2 mineralizing CO2. Uh, something we're doing, this is in British Columbia. The big um, silver box is a reclaimer beside a concrete plant. It's full of waste slurry from the concrete production and the CO2 tank, recycling CO2 into the cement, contained in that slurry, and then that slurry goes back into the concrete. So you got this way to get the mineralized CO2 into your concrete. And the last one here is just an example of well, another CO2 tank beside a concrete plant, but in this case it's being injected into the concrete mixer as an admixture. So there's lots of ways that if you're putting this concrete, if you're putting CO2 into concrete, either deliberate, 
deliberately or naturally through atmospheric carbonation. There's a number of different ways you can actually look at uh, quantifying that. If you have a, a closed process, perhaps you can do something quite easily on a mass balance basis or a mass gain basis. Uh, we've seen uh, SEM earlier today, so that's a way you can do elemental mapping with SEM. Quantitative XRD is a, a popular process. You can get into uh, infrared or Fourier transformation, infrared Raman isotope measurements. You can also look at these other techniques that could be divided in between doing something thermally to decompose the carbonates or chemically. So that'll be just heating it up, and so you can do TGA. TJ with the mass spec, and I'm going to talk about here is this other technique in correct analysis, and chemically you can do acid digestion to release the CO2. So amongst all these techniques, they'll have various advantages, and uh, I'll be specifically talking about what we're doing with infrared induction analysis. So what's happening here? Um, why, why has there been a technique that's invented that's only just going to measure carbon and sulfur? Well, these are two things that are kind of difficult to measure. You can you often will have difficulty quantifying these things through a direct spectrographic method. But what they've, they've done, um, two examples of machines are on the right. These are benchtop devices that basically contain an induction furnace, the schematic is shown there. So you take a, a sample, you raise it into that induction heating zone and it heats up very rapidly to a very high temperature above 2,000 degrees. And basically, you drive off well, everything out of the sample that's going to fly off and melt the sample at that heat. Uh, and with an oxygen, oxygen flowing through the furnace, any carbon that's driven off will form carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide, and any sulfur driven off will form sulfur dioxide. And this, those can be picked up by an infrared sensor quantified. And then, if you know how, the mass of the sample that you put in, now you can determine the mass of the sample that was originally carbon or sulfur. And if you know other things about your sample, you can turn that into carbonates or sulfates. So a technique like this, you would be taking um, uh, carbon contents or sulfur contents that are from very low abundances up to 12%, so we're talking about four decimal place worth of uh, detectable carbon. Uh, when you do have a measurement that's it's sensitive to 0.1 ppm of this element within the sample that you're measuring, uh, and you get pretty accurate or consistent results as you, as you uh, look at different uh, amounts of carbon, the sample mass is pretty small. You're only going to put in a half a gram or a gram. It goes into this um, crucible, as you see on the top right. Um, and you'd be me measuring that in advance. How much sample are you putting in? Then you put it in this induction furnace. And this induction furnace is not the, the test thing at all, but this is just an example of induction heating. You have highly localized high heat. So you, you put it in the thing and it goes into the device and within 40 to 50 seconds you get a result. So you get your, what was the carbon content? What was the, the sulfur content of your sample? Further, in comparison to other techniques or other approaches, um, even though this is limited to giving you two pieces of information, there's no specialized training. There's, there's no like difficulty in analyzing the results. It just spits out a number <laughs> that's carbon. It spits out a number that's and the training to measure the sample, put it in the thing, push the button, go, take out the sample, and move to the next one. You can pick that up pretty quick. And because when you're talking about analytical and you're comparing the different ways you might get the same answer, time is often money. So if you're only going to spend 40 to 50 seconds to get a result, it can be a very inexpensive way to get that result. So what you would get is on the on the left hand side would be the abundance measured through your infrared sensors, and on the right hand side is your time. So as you heat up the sample, you start to see the carbon and the sulfur leaving, leaving the sample. The infrared sensor quantifies how much it is with time, and then at the end, it's able to just give you quantity. Where is this carbon coming from? So obviously, when you're making cements, particularly nowadays, you're going to have lots of high abundance of uh, limestone just in your cement. Uh, 
you can have calcium carbonate that's been deliberately put there through some of these CO2 utilization approaches. You could have carbon aluminate phases, carbon convert, carbon from your fly ash, and you could even have carbon coming from your admixture. So if you have a technique that's going to detect fractions of the PPM, you may be able to pick up carbon or organic materials from um, your additives and admixtures. The sulfur, on the other hand, could be part of one of the anhydrous cement phases. It could be, you know, present as a sulfo aluminate, could be from durability question, sulfates coming from the environment, going into the sample, sulfates in your aggregates, and you could have admixtures that contain sulfur in various So when you're just getting a carbon number or a sulfur number, it's actually not telling you where it's coming from, from any of these things, but if you know what you're actually measuring, know what experiment you're doing, you typically have a baseline, you know the additive carbon or the additive sulfur, where, where it came from. What are some applications of this technique? You can see an example. This was from uh, Norway, uh, Norwegian Building Research Institute in 2005. They've taken um, demolished and crushed concrete and put it in some sort of treatment process, and you can see they have different size fractions uh, with treatment time and then amount of CO2 on the vertical axis. And you can see they've made a pretty detailed curve. I looked at this curve, I think I counted, there was like 25 or 30 points along whatever, whichever curve you want. And I thought to myself, if I was doing this with a TGA and I'm going to spend 90 minutes, two hours to get one of those data points in a TGA, and all I want to know is I've treated this with CO2. The only thing happened to my specimen during the treatment is it absorbed CO2. I can get that result of this carbon analyzer in a minute makes it quite easy to, to generate the data for a study like this. Uh, this is some work that, that I did, looking at a number of different materials, uh, treating them with CO2, comparing how much CO2 goes in uh, in the same sample. If I measured it with the infrared sensor versus uh, TGA, or sorry, masking. Uh, so this was a quasi-closed system, and so uh, you know we saw some generally good agreement, but they said, and another one, when you're talking about um, durability questions, atmospheric carbonation of uh, concrete and service, you could do profiling the same way you would do uh, chloride diffusion profiles. You can do the same thing with uh, carbonate diffusion. You take slices of your sample, do uh, a depth profile or a profile from the exposed surface uh, into the depth of the sample and come up with some diffusion information of CO2 going through that. So we see this as part of, say, the GCCA strategies and saying the uh, sustainability of concrete is somewhat tied to its ability to absorb CO2. This is giving a technique like this, is giving a stronger uh, confidence in this. Switching to sulfur, then, if uh, you're talking about durability questions, I think this uh, results results came from Quebec, where they do have some problems with sulfate bearing aggregates, and they did some, you know, post-mortem where they took some concrete cores from some affected uh, building foundations, uh, used this technique to get the sulfur content, which helps them in their modeling of, of the impacts of the uh, Two more examples about sulfate. This one is from Mike Thomas, the top curve, one of those sport curves, the triangles. <laughs> Is it? Uh, no, it's one of the middle curves is triangles. That's with uh, sulfate. It's been measured as a penetration into a sample using some, using some concrete that's been uh, put in the, the ocean over 10 years at the BRE exposure site. So he's able to track the variation in composition of the concrete under marine exposure, tracking the sulfates, magnesium oxide, uh, sodium, and the chlorine. So it's just in addition to looking at the durability metrics of these other deleterious species, able to include uh, uh, sulfates. And another um, piece of work out of his lab, one of his uh, grad students, uh, Ashley Hossack, is looking at this study, again, looking at penetration of uh, sulfates from a, like a seawater exposure into pastes, 
looking at the effect of different um, mixed designs, looking at the effect of different SCMs, and, and able to take this information and be uh, more confident about modeling. You know, what was the effect on making these different changes on the, the uh, susceptibility to damage by the uh, sulfate agents? So ultimately, there are some limitations to this technique. Like I said, it does two things, <laughs> carbon and sulfur, but it does them pretty well. But it's only going to give you total carbon. So if you're looking at carbon from multiple sources, like if you have an inorganic uh, con contributor, to the carbon in your system, you'd have to get a, a modified technique. You could still use this device, but you'd have to have a separate detector for the inorganic carbon. Additionally, as mentioned, if you can get carbon coming from a listed six or seven different ways with sulfate, it's not going to tell you which of those places the carbon was before it made it into the infrared sensor. So it's well designed for those before and after type comparisons, before it goes into service, after it comes out service, so you know what was there in the beginning, and then you can say, well, I didn't add any fly ash during the 10 years of exposure, so the CO2 didn't come from the fly ash, it came from atmospheric CO2. TGA is a good technique for, it's more time consuming for quantifying um, calcium carbonate, and it also gives you a bit more information because different polymorphs of calcium carbonate can decompose at different temperatures, and you're not going to get that information with this technique. You're just going to get that number, and you may be able to say it's all carbonate, but you won't be able to say what polymorph or what proportion within each polymorph. As with many techniques, this is not specific to this technique, but you're talking about small samples, it's a gram or less, and you're talking about how concrete can be a very heterogeneous material. You have to be careful about your conclusions with respect to the sample you took it from. Is the sample you analyze representative of the full sample? Given that you can do uh, the testing very quickly, under a minute, it gives you the latitude to do lots of samples, maybe approach the public problem from that perspective. But ultimately, this could be part of an analytical strategy. Uh, in particular, um, some of the work we've been doing to, to calculate uh, carbonates is improved by taking the, analyzing the sample and saying how much of it is actually cement and how much of it is not, how much is sand, depending on how you sample it. So you can stick it in a quantitative XRD and figure out the sand fraction and use that to improve your conclusions from your carbon analysis. To sum up, and this is an example of the inductively heated uh, sample as it's post analysis, it's flaming hot. Um, it's a rapid technique, it's a very simple technique, simple to learn, simple to execute. It's accurate, it's precise. You have to be careful about your sampling and what your conclusions mean when you're analyzing such small amounts of material. It does have a limited scope when you're using it alone, it's just going to be the carbon content or the sulfur content. But it fits in well with the other techniques you might have in your arsenal. TGA, XRF, XRD. XRF in particular, you might see a lot of things uh, published. Where they talk about the analysis of a cement and we did the carbon and sulfur using, they might use a trade name, Ultra or Eco often, uh, instead of saying inferred induction. But that's uh, where, where that fits in. Thank you.